So we know what heaven is. Heaven is our destination. That's where we're going. So how do we get there? In John 14, verse 4 now, Jesus says, You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas, one of the apostles, said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, so how do we get to heaven? Well, Jesus is the only way that we can. Thomas points out here among the disciples, you know, well, we don't know the way. How do we, we don't even know where you're going. How do we know the way? And people, always, people are always ragging on Thomas, always giving Thomas a hard time. He's doubting Thomas. He has to have proof. I really sympathize with Thomas. If I was one of the apostles, I'd probably be Thomas. You know, he's just the one who has to have things spelled out for him, clear, right in front of him. And Jesus doesn't get mad about that. He just, he lets it go. He answers the questions that Thomas has. And Jesus says, no one goes to the Father except through him. Well, that's kind of narrow-minded, isn't it? It's awfully exclusive. Can't there be more than one way to get to heaven? Well, Jesus isn't exactly concerned with, uh, with people's feelings at this point. He's more concerned with absolute truth in this statement. In Acts 4.12, Jesus says, salvation, or um, it says in Acts 4.12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. That name is Jesus Christ. There's no other means of salvation besides that name. Now, that does pose a little bit of a problem when we do try to spread the word, try to tell people about God, because a very common response is, well, isn't that kind of narrow? Isn't it bad that only one path works? Well, let's look at it this way. Let me give you an analogy. Um, let's say I spend, I spend way too much money, and I go into massive debt, and I am on the brink of bankruptcy. Well, let's say I find one of those debt organizations, a really good one, not the ones that just want to cheat you and take your money, the debt organizations that are really going to help you out, and they're going to do it completely for free. So let's say I call this organization to get some help out of my debt, and they say, okay, here's what we're going to do. We can definitely help you. We're going to send one of our agents to your house to talk with you and look at your finances and tell you specifically what to do, but we have got you handled. It's, it's over. You don't have to worry about debt. And now I say, no, 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 no. I don't want you to send one of your agents here. My finances are, my, are, my, are, are confidential to me. I don't want anyone else to see it. Do it some other way. Get me out of debt a different way. Well, maybe they'd say, well, sir, we can't, we can't get you out of debt of a different way. We have to know what's going on. We have to see your finances. You have to let this agent come and speak to you from our company. And I say, no, no, no. If you don't find another way to get me out of debt, I'm not going to do it. Now, here's the thing. That's not being too exclusive on that company's part. If I end up declaring bankruptcy a few months later, it's not the company's fault for not offering multiple paths because sometimes there is only one way to get out of debt. Not only is Christ the only way to salvation, but there's actually a consequence. We're told there's not a consequence to accepting him. John 3.36 says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. Now, doesn't that pose a problem? That's not fair. Just because I don't want to follow Jesus' way, I can't be saved. I have to take the wrath of God. Well, no, the wrath is already there. It says God's wrath remains on him. You see, we have all sinned. We've all done it willingly, knowingly. And so, as a result of our own actions, there's a punishment that's coming. Here's the thing. All God has done is offer us a way to get around that punishment. He put his son in our place and said, If you will take it, my son will take your punishment instead of you. Let me give you another example. Imagine, let's say they're doing, this is a true example, let's say they're doing flu shots somewhere, free flu shots. And someone says, hey, do you want a free flu shot? And I say, no, I don't want a flu shot. I'm not going to get one. This actually happened and I got sick later. On. I said, no, I don't want a flu shot. Now, if I say that, I say that fully knowing that the flu is out there, it's real, but by not taking the shot, I'm taking a risk of having to handle it, having to take the full force of getting the flu. Now, if I get the flu and I get sick, it's not the flu's fault. It's not the fault of the people who are offering me the free flu shot. I'm the only one to blame. I have a means out. I have a way of escaping that flu. If I don't take it, then I'm just not accepting it myself. But here's the thing. The good news is God has made a way for us in Jesus. If you've already accepted Jesus, if you've already made him your savior and you're forgiven, there are several things that I think you should do, several things that are important in the Christian life. First off, be thankful for what God has done. How many times a week do you thank God for his son, for the salvation that he gives you? It should be a lot more than one, I'll tell you that much. 
God has done something amazing he didn't have to do. He has given us his own son so that we can be saved. So thank him for that. Be thankful. Second, you know, if we've already received the salvation of Christ, we can tell others about Jesus. We can share that salvation. Jesus didn't just die for me. Jesus didn't just die for everyone sitting in this room. Jesus died for an entire world. And there are people out there who don't understand exactly what that means. So we should make it our job to tell them what it means. Now, we talked about evangelism last week and effective methods of that. But one more very important thing to do is to pray. Be thankful. Tell people about Jesus, but pray for the people who don't know Jesus as well. Pray for your family members who aren't Christians. Pray for your friends. Pray for the missionaries who are out all over the world trying to bring people to Christ. Pray about it. Pray for those people. So, with all that said, what do we do now? We know that heaven is our destination. We know that Christ is the only way, but God's provided a means of us getting there. So what do we do now? Last question. Well, in John 14, verse 1, back at the beginning of what Jesus is saying, he says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. What do we do now? Well, we can be comforted. Heaven is our comfort. Jesus was speaking this, don't let your hearts be troubled. He was speaking this to his disciples right at this point, knowing that soon he was going to go and be crucified. The apostles were going to be scattered. Their entire world was about to be flipped upside down. And yet his, his response to all that is, it's okay, trust God and trust me, because there is something better coming. Heaven is coming. Here's the thing, where we are now, life isn't that hard. Life is pretty easy. We get off pretty easy living where we are in the culture. We, we've, got it, we've got it made pretty well. But difficulties still happen. Tough times still come. And when they do, remember that this life is only temporary. We know God has something really great planned for us in heaven. Philippians 1.23, Paul says, I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. In other words, going on, if I just go ahead and die and be with Christ, that's better than living. But I still have work to do for God. I have more to do in this life. But it would be so great, so great to be with Jesus this very minute. Here's the thing. God has planned something awesome, and it's coming eventually. When it does come, it's going to be great. Revelations 21.4 says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. I'll tell you, I'll give you an example. When I played basketball in high school, I wasn't much of an athlete, and I wasn't much of a runner. But uh, when I played basketball, the one thing I hated was the conditioning. At the end of practice, we just had to stand on this line of the court and run back and forth across the court, and there was no point in it. We weren't putting a ball down the court, and it didn't do any good. But we had to do that as part of the team. And I know some of you were thinking, well, you shouldn't have played then, and you're probably right. I probably shouldn't have. But I hated, I hated running. I hated conditioning. That was absolutely the worst thing. But thankfully, though, early on in the season, I actually considered, I don't think I can do this. I may quit this team, because if I have to, it's not, the fun I get out of playing basketball isn't worth having to run. But my coach told me early on, told us, told the whole team, you know, we'll run and we'll do conditioning, but then once the season starts, then we'll start, then we'll start uh, trying to get our conditioning more in practice. And so we're not going to have to run after practices once the, once the season starts. And so for that whole preseason training, I was focusing on that one time when I, wouldn't ha when I could play basketball without having to run after practices. And just focusing on that one time that was going to come, I knew something better was coming, and that's what kept me going. That's what comforted me through my immense suffering through having to run across the court back and forth. Because I knew that there was something better coming. Heaven is our comfort from the problems of this life. When things don't go right, don't worry about it. Don't let the things that go wrong, don't let them get you down. Look forward to heaven. Think about heaven. God has got something really great planned for you. Now, with that said, maybe there's some people here who don't know Jesus yet, who don't have that comfort. You can't quite count on that comfort yet. If that's the fact, if that's, if that's the case with you, then I want to let you know heaven is free for everyone. God has written you a blank check. All you have to do is flip it over and endorse the back. The question is, are you going to take what God has given you? If you haven't accepted Christ yet, if you haven't publicly confessed your faith in Him, if you haven't been baptized into His family, and if you haven't started living the kind of life that honors God, then it's something you really need to think about, something you should really be considering. Because God, I guarantee you this, God has promised you something great. The only question is whether or not you're going to take it. 
our invitation hymn is going to be number 299. We'll sing the first, second, and last verse. Now, for those of us who are saved by Christ, we know that heaven is our destination. We know that God has made a way for us to get there through Jesus. And we know that that future hope, that's what gives us comfort. That's what can keep us going in life.